This meeting is now being recorded. Good day and welcome to the Mental Health Transition Panel 2, Rethinking Housing. As you will notice, all participants have been muted. If you have any technical issues, please send a chat to all panelists and hosts, the directions of which you can find in your chat window. Thank you for joining and please welcome Michael Bird from Trinity Church, Wall Street. Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us today for the second panel in the Mental Health and Transition series presented by Fountain House in partnership with Trinity Church Wall Street. I'm Father Michael Bird, the vicar at Trinity Church. Here at Trinity Church Wall Street, social justice is one of our core values and is foundational to our mission to build neighborhoods, generations of faithful leadership and financial capacity. Our work in partnership with others aims to break the cycles of mass incarceration, mass homelessness, and housing instability in New York City. Through our direct outreach work, our advocacy, speaking in the pulpit and in public, and philanthropy, we are actively seeking to transform our neighborhood by changing systems, organizational structures, and attitudes for lasting change. And we know that our engagement with these issues must include advocacy for those people living with serious mental illness. And we are truly proud to be partnering with Fountain House in this work. And now an opening prayer. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest a place near your altar, O Lord. Heaven is your throne and the earth your footstool. Time and again, you brought your people from exile and the wilderness to places of refuge and safety. Good and gracious God, you have called us to a vision of home and sanctuary for all people. You have called us to share our food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter and when we see the naked to clothe them. Grant us safety and courage as we build your kingdom by providing places of refuge and inspiring others to do the same. Bless our panel today with wisdom, open hearts and inspired speech. Bless all of us who seek to do your will through our love of neighbor and bless all those in need of refuge and sanctuary and home. You are the God who loves us all and knows us each by name. And what do you require of us but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you and one another? Amen. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ashwin Vassan, President and CEO of Fountain House. Thank you so much, Father Bird. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Ashwin Vassan, President and CEO of Fountain House. For those of you who are new here, Fountain House is a national mental health nonprofit fighting to improve health, to increase opportunity, and to end social and economic isolation for people living with serious mental illness. Over 70 years ago here in New York City, we originated the Clubhouse model, a model of social infrastructure based on principles of social work and human-centered design, created to build community, break isolation, and improve health and opportunity for people who are uniquely marginalized and who live with health conditions that are isolating in their own right. Our work has been replicated more than 300 times around the US and the globe, including 14 affiliates right here in New York City. Over these seven decades, we have come to understand the basic truth that stable and affordable housing is a sine qua non of recovery with mental illness. That being stably housed is a necessary condition to allow people to fully engage with their health, to seize opportunities, and to participate in community. Thank you so much for joining us for the second panel in our series, Mental Health in Transition presented by Fountain House in partnership with Trinity Church Wall Street. I especially wanna thank you for joining us given this terrible weather. <laughs> and I'm grateful to technology for making this possible 
for us to be together today. But I'm also mindful that uh, so many of our unhoused neighbors are out there at this moment struggling to say, stay safe and dry. And, and I hope as we engage in this conversation, we'll keep them in our thoughts and in our prayers. For those of you who joined us for panel one, thank you for continuing with us as we explore these pressing issues and push for new solutions in a post-pandemic New York City. For those of you who missed our first panel, Reinventing Public Safety, a video recording of the event can be accessed at fountainhouse.org backslash MHIT for mental health and transition. Mental health lives and flows through so many aspects of policy and practice in our city, evidenced by the prominence that issues like closing Rikers Island, the increase in our unhoused populations, lack of access to mental health care, and lack of social infrastructure have been discussed and debated throughout the mayoral race. Unfortunately, embedded within each of these challenges are the myriad ways we have left people behind in the process. This is especially true for New Yorkers living with mental illness, and it's time to change that. The rising rates of mental health needs have simply brought this chronic issue into sharper focus, and we must address it as the public health crisis that it is. Today's panel is Rethinking Housing, an issue that we've all been forced to reflect on in the past year, whether we were securely housed or not. While many people who were fortunate to have housing suddenly experienced their homes becoming a simultaneous place of work, daycare, school, and forced isolation, far too many were left to choose between the streets where they faced risks from the elements and COVID to interpersonal danger or congregate settings where they faced exposure and other threats. Job loss and the economic security it created increased our unstably housed and unhoused populations to levels unseen in decades. And when innovative solutions like utilizing vacant hotel rooms for people experiencing homelessness were enacted, we saw unhoused populations move to safer settings, only sadly to be met with backlash and stigma by their neighbors. As immediate hardships due to the pandemic have slowly begun to ease, we know that there are still people who won't be able to make rent, who face eviction, and whose unaddressed mental health and substance use needs make it imperative for us to find permanent solutions to our housing crisis. The 2020 US Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development Survey found that more than half a million people were experiencing homelessness across the country on a single night. And more than 20% of them had a serious mental illness. According to the Coalition for the Homeless, in fiscal year 2020, New York City counted more than 120,000 adults and children sleeping in the municipal shelter system. And the number of homeless single adults is now 103% higher than it was 10 years ago. These numbers are likely underestimated as it's incredibly hard to accurately track the unhoused homeless population that does not have any contact with the shelter system. For people living with serious mental illness, we know how vital housing is to recover. At Fountain House, approximately 40% of our members have experienced homelessness or unstable housing when they arrive, but 99% of our members are stably housed within a year of joining. It's not an easy feat to accomplish. Complex housing applications and Unrealistic eligibility requirements present significant hurdles for individuals who need housing, forcing them to stay in survival mode that continues to deteriorate their health and mental health while the bureaucracy remains inert. But our social practitioners and our membership continue to fight, filling in those applications because we know housing is a basic human right. We will continue to navigate these broken systems while fighting simultaneously to fix them. Fountain House is rooted in innovation and in refusing to accept the status quo. According, accordingly, witnessing acute need, we expanded our programming during the pandemic to create on-ramps, a collection of outreach programs supporting people who are justice involved and or experiencing homelessness and substance use disorders, and piloting solutions that meet them where they are with dignity, humanity, and respect in order to build relationships and trust that will ultimately bring them into housing and programming such as Fountain House's Clubhouse and Care Management Services. My colleague, Nancy Young, who leads this work, is on the panel today to speak more about these programs in action. Tom Harris, president of the Times Square Alliance and one of our partners in this work is also on the panel. In addition to Times Square Alliance, these new programs would not have been possible without our partners like Breaking Ground, Midtown Community Court, and the Center for Court Innovation, 
the Partnership for Public Spaces, New York City Parks, Fort Greene Park Conservancy, and the Van Emmeringen Foundation, just to name a few. We're really deeply grateful to all of our funders, donors, and supporters who continue to invest in this work. And today, I'm so pleased that Andy Newman, reporter from the New York Times, is moderating our second panel. Andy reports on social services and poverty for the Times, and his coverage of the myriad challenges that people experiencing homelessness face, especially during COVID, has opened countless eyes to the broken systems that the most vulnerable New Yorkers are subjected to every day. I want to thank all of our panelists today, Shams, Nancy, Tom, and Bea, for joining us to share your insight and what solutions you hope our incoming administration will invest in. We know there's a lot of work to do. No one can do this alone. And so we're grateful to all of the panelists in our series and to all of you, our audience members, for making these issues a priority. Over to you, Andy. Thanks so much, Ashwin, and welcome to everyone. Thank you all for jo joining us this morning. Um, one more statistic. According to the city, there are nearly 300,000 adult New Yorkers who are living with serious mental illness, but there are only about 35,000 units of supportive housing in New York City. That is housing that comes with a full range of on-site social services, and that is for everyone, people with mental illness, people who are struggling with substance abuse, people coming from prison who may not be ready to transition to, to fully independent housing. So there is a very big gap. Um, we know that there are thousands of people who could flourish in supportive housing in the city who are in shelters or in streets, in jail, or stuck in a revolving door between the shelters and the streets and the jails and hospitals and rehabs and other places. So today, I'm very glad uh, that we're going to be talking to some people who are trying to help close that gap for the most vulnerable New Yorkers and share a little bit about what is working and what isn't and what some future solutions might look like. Um, joining me today are Shams DeBaron. Shams was homeless for most of his life um, and became a voice for homeless New Yorkers last year when the Lucerne Hotel on the Upper West Side was turned into an emergency pandemic shelter and then became a lightning rod for community opposition. Um, Shams is now housed happily, but he has continued to advocate and try to, try to hold the city and shelter providers accountable. And you can often find him wherever there is a candidate uh, or a TV camera. Um, also with me, Nancy Young, who is the director of the on-ramps program at Fountain House. On-ramps is a group of outreach programs that try to help people who are experiencing homelessness and who have mental illness, as well as people coming out of the criminal justice system and try to connect them to housing uh, using peer counselors, clubhouses, detox centers, and a bunch of other tools. Uh, also with us is Tom Harris, president of the Times Square Alliance, which is a business improvement district that works to promote Times Square. Mr. Harris is a former police officer and inspector, and under his leadership, the Alliance has been doing some innovative outreach work to people experiencing homelessness in Times Square, of whom there have been a great many during the pandemic. And we have Beatrice de la Torre. She is the managing director of the Housing and Homeless Initiative at Trinity Church Wall Street Philanthropies, which is the city's biggest private funder of anti-homelessness efforts and which gives out more than $10 million in grants annually and is constantly looking for ways to make their money go farther and get more people housed. So thank you all, all, all of you. Um, we're going to start in with one question for each of you just to kind of help people understand where you're coming from and then we will open things up a little bit with questions that everybody can jump in on. So let's start with Shams this morning. Um, Shams, uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your lived experience with homelessness, the things that you've seen both in shelters and on the streets and how all of that um, affected your mental health. Um, and in addition, if you want to talk about just in, in general, uh, how does being in the homeless system affect the mental health of people who are already struggling 
with substance abuse issues or psychological problems and uh, end up creating a need for even more supportive housing. So Shams, just kind of give us a little bit, bit of background. Well, quickly, um, my story starts basically at the age of two when I was placed in the foster care. Uh, I was um, experiencing uh, uh, homelessness at the age of 10. Uh, and by the age of 12, I was permanently discharged from the uh, foster care system into the streets. So my struggle with homelessness have been for most of my life. As a, a single adult parent, I raised my son uh, throughout his junior high school and high school years in family shelters. And then as an adult, a single adult, I uh, ex uh, experienced being in uh, various shelters throughout the city. Uh, you can go all the way back from the beginning <laughs> and see patterns of uh, experiences that cause great trauma although I didn't understand it growing up, but being homeless and being in the streets, on the trains and in these congregate shelters. Uh, well, first, let me just say in these congregate shelters that I was at, the experience from walking in the door, whether you go through Bellevue and you end up somewhere else was completely traumatic. Um, it's a dehumanizing process. So if I thought I was bad before I walked in there simply because I didn't have a home, it got worse when I when I went through those doors. And um, it was so bad for me that I ended up going to the safety of the streets where I was able to regain, believe it or not, a sense of dignity on my park bench here in Harlem and have a little space to myself and not be subjected to... Um, these type of experiences that are dehumanizing. So as terms of mental health, I wasn't looking at things from that perspective, but I did notice that my behavior was changing in terms of me becoming a little more agitated easily, becoming angry easily. And it just was getting worse as time progressed. I, to cope because I didn't want to hurt anybody. I wasn't trying to hurt myself. I started drinking and the drinking was started to get out of control. And I didn't notice it at first until I ended up in the hospital in the emergency room for high blood pressure. And they were explaining to me how the excessive drinking was also was not a good thing for me. And that's when I began to say, wait a minute, I'm, I must need some help. And so I, I started to go when uh, like we care, different services within the city, and I started asking them for help. I didn't know where to go, or what to do. I didn't even understand this as being a real problem, but I said, something's wrong and, and I, I need help. And they were just trying to give me a job. <laughs> it's like, I don't need a job. I need help. I don't, I don't want to drink, you know? Um, also, I began to have um, suicidal thoughts as time progressed. It, it, the drinking went from having a good time or euphoric state for a couple of minutes to breaking down crying to uh, to actually being severely depressed. And that depression was turning into thoughts of suicide. And that's when I knew I was really in trouble. And uh, in my attempt to just get out of the city and try to go somewhere else, uh, I ended up encountering uh, some police officers on the train <laughs> and I went, it ended up put, putting me in a more tra another traumatic situation where I um, was placed in handcuffs, taken to uh, a, pri a, a jail cell and then taken to a shelter and told that if I, if I stay there, I wouldn't get a ticket. And if I left the shelter, uh, I would get a ticket, which more than likely would turn into uh, a warrant. So I stayed there and in my effort to turn a negative into a positive, thank goodness I was at a place called Project Renewal, which I know I knew had services. And I immediately went to get those services and um, it was the best thing that I could have done. And that's where I learned the value of having uh, services such as uh, 
uh, um, treatment for substance use and also seeing a psychiatrist. Let's um, let's thank you very much, James. Um, uh, let's turn to Nancy now. Um, Nancy, would you like to start by just explaining a little bit about what on ramps and Fountain House do to to help people get access to supportive housing and to bridge those gaps that can keep people who qualify for supportive housing from actually getting it? What are some of the hurdles you find yourselves fighting against and what are some of the solutions? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to start just because it'll help me with my nervousness right now to just share that um, today's my birthday. Happy and birthday. Really happy to be here on my birthday and to just also celebrate that I've been at Fountain House for 12 years. And the reason I'm saying those things is just because I feel so committed to the model of Fountain House that, you know, thinking about my life, I'm definitely going to be there for the rest of my working life because of the power of the community at Fountain House. It is, it, hopefully some of you will come and take a tour and learn what we're all about. I know Shams has been there and saw the beautiful space. And the reason I'm bringing that up is just because it is a powerful influence that has transformed lives. I've seen it happen throughout my time at Fountain House. And what we wanted to do with the on-ramps program is to take the power of that community and the dignity and the respect that we offer people out into the community outside of Fountain House. And we wanted to engage with people where they are. We wanted to build trusting relationships with people because that's what we see works at Fountain House. We see that people feel safe when they were previously disconnected. We feel that people know that they're being heard, that people are leaning in and listening to them and, and giving them an individualized solution, working towards their goals, and not just doing a cookie cutter one size fits all to everybody who has a you know certain problem. So this is this is what we do best and we feel like not only do we do that best, we also build partnerships really well with other community organizations which is what we did with on ramps. So we're going to take our experience with community building and we're also going to take our experience with members of Fountain House who uh, many of whom have become peers, helping other people, using their shared experience to help other people who are going through the same thing. At Fountain House, members help members. We have enormous peer program that we, you know, people are helping each other. And we want to take that out into the community and have peers helping folks. Um, and that's what we're doing in both Times Square and in Fort Greene Park in Brooklyn right now. So what we're trying to do is collaborate with the community organizations that are already in existence in those locations. So in Times Square, we've had an amazing, beautiful collaboration as Ashwin pointed out with Midtown Community Corp, Breaking Ground and the Times Square Alliance. And most recently Housing Works and Center for Urban Community Services, all of whom do an amazing job already with the work that they do. So joining them has been a total pleasure and has also helped us realize, you know, we can be the mental health component while other people can do what they do well. So we have the street outreach component that is beautifully done by Breaking Ground and they've hired peers from Fountain House to, to work with them and do the street out, outreach. But we also had a beautiful royal blue um, kiosk built in the middle of Times Square with the help of Times Square Alliance and, and Midtown Community Court and Breaking Ground who contributed to that and also was, was built by the Project for Public Spaces. This is a kiosk that people can charge their phones, can get a cup of hot coffee and some cold water and just stand and, and socialize and connect. And we've had people come back to the kiosk over and over again. We've had a great success with connecting people to benefits, connecting people to um, getting free phones, getting IDs, seeing our psychiatrist, even becoming members of Fountain House, and even then turning around and getting jobs at the kiosk. 
We also have a program, as you may have heard from Christina Sparrick, who spoke in the last panel, that she designed. She's a member of Fountain House, and she developed a curriculum that we taught at the Fort Greene Park to the Parks Department there and to the five peers who were hired to be in the park. It's a person-centered intervention approach that meets people where they are, people who are disconnected, who spend a lot of time in the park, whether they're homeless or not, whether they have mental illness or not, we are there to be present and see if, if what they need is something that we can help them with. Um, and if we can't, we will connect them with what they need and, and meet them where they're at. So, um, you know, I, just to kind of sum it all up, our, our goal with OnRamps is to, to basically meet people where they are, to help people from being feeling disconnected and to hopefully if they feel that they can trust us and, and you know, make a connection with us, that they will let us know how we can help them and we can connect them to the services that they need. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Nancy. And that provides a very nice segue into the work that Tom has been doing uh, as the head of the Times Square Alliance. Tom, can you talk a little bit about what the Alliance has been doing to help connect people who are uh, staying in the street in Times Square to permanent housing and especially how your your history uh, working as a police officer has kind of informed your your thinking about solutions. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Andy. Uh, so the Times Square Alliance has been in existence for about 30 years. And I don't think when people think of a business improvement district, uh, they think that someone would um, care about the people in the community over the businesses in the community. And that's probably why we're called the Times Square Alliance and not the Business Improvement District, because we see everyone within Times Square as our stakeholders from the billionaire developer to the unhoused person in front of the theater on, on 44th Street. So from the beginning, uh, when Times Square wasn't like it was today, um, we've had strategic partnerships. So at the, at the beginning, our, our mission was to make Times Square clean, safe, and fun, but we never wanted to do that at the expense of those who, who lived in Times Square be, before we got here. So we formed partnerships with Breaking Ground. Uh, it was common ground at the time uh, to help people who were unhoused on the street. And uh, it, it was nice to hear Shams mention Project Renewal because we had a longstanding relationship with Project Renewal. And in fact, most of our operations team came through the Project Renewal program. And one of the sadder parts of, of my tenure here was when Project Renewal went in a different direction and uh, could no longer really assist us. They, they sort of moved more to the Bronx and less, less to, the, to the smaller settings that we have. So we've had other strategic relationships. And then, um, then we've had a longstanding relationship with the Center for Court Innovation. And what's great about the Center for Court Innovation is that they have these unique community courts set up throughout the city. And I was very familiar with the Red Hook Justice Center before I, I came to, to Midtown. And th they provide services. They provide services for people who walk in the front door, as well as people who come in uh, through the back door, through, through law enforcement. And they look to, to divert them from the criminal justice system and offer services. So we've had, um, we've had a longstanding um, history of looking to help people in the neighborhood, first with just breaking ground. And we never, we were sort of ahead of the curve in not having the police deal with the unhoused in Times Square. And I think I realized uh, from my time in the police department that that's not what the police should be doing. The police should be dealing with, with crimes, uh, dealing with serious crimes and restoring public, uh, a, a sense of public security. And our public safety team, we, we have always identified people in our public safety team uh, who aren't police officers, who work hand in glove with breaking ground and who go out and, and have offered services to the unhoused in Times Square. So that was always the model. The only time we ever involved law enforcement is if they were 
a danger to themselves or to others. And I, I can honestly say that that really has only in my 14 years or almost 14 years here, maybe a half a dozen times. And when we finally um, did get law enforcement involved, it was because it was with the help of a psychiatrist from breaking ground. And it was part of a, an overall plan to try to try to help the individual, not to subject them to, to the criminal justice system. So then fast forward to the, to the pandemic. Um, we saw uh, overnight the population in Times Square go from 365,000 people a day to 30,000 people. And our, our homeless population, those who sleep on the streets, almost double. So, and small numbers, but double is double. We went from about 15 people sleeping on the street pre-pandemic to 30 people uh, in, at the height of the pandemic. And then we also saw that, that people from congregate shelters were brought throughout the city to, to hotels and hotels were repurposed. And the problem with that from my perspective was that they lost all their services. So one of the great parts about the, the congregate shelters is, or from, from my perception of them, is that there were social workers and programs to help those who were there um, and meet them where they are and then, then bring them to another level. And that all stopped. Uh, we, we had to stay apart. They were in, uh, they, they couldn't get together within the, the hotels and offer services. So they were, were put on the street. Uh, and that, that really caused a lot of issues for them, more so for them than for, for, for the office workers or what you would think the businesses, because quite honestly, everyone was working remote. Uh, but we saw at the Alliance, we saw a gap. We saw a gap with the decriminalization of quality of life issues and the overall depolicing uh, and the services provided to people in need on the street. So I think last December, we met with, with our, the people who we knew, um, Center for Court Innovation, Midtown Community Court, and Breaking Ground. And we said, look, there's a gap out here. Uh, we're not helping people on the street who need assistance. We need to be able to do better. And again, from my perspective, I'm not sure that we have a housing problem. We have a mental health problem and we have people who aren't ready to accept services on the street. Now, I think when I was talking with Andy yesterday, for all the wrong reasons, people on the street um, who, who had challenges got services when they had an encounter with the criminal justice system. When they went into, um, when they were arrested for lower level offenses, they were diverted to services. When we stopped arresting people for quality of life offenses. In Times Square, it didn't seem like there was a proactive strategy to meet people where they were on the street and bring them to the next level. Housing was not the first concern for these individuals. Oftentimes there, was, there were underlying issues and the system that was in place had all sorts of barriers to entry. So we found that, that when, um, when people were just offered, if they, when people were approached by, the, by the, the, um, the folks from Breaking Ground and DSS, they were asked if they, had, um, if, if they needed help, if they needed a bed. And if the answer was no and no, then they moved on to the next person. And we felt that if, if we could spend a little bit more time, get to know the individuals, build trust in the, in, in the system, that the system wasn't going to hurt them, that, um, that we could actually affect change in their lives, get them the services that they need. It could be ID, it could be a job, it could be socks, it could be a coat, it could be food. But if we could start to build trust, we can actually um, help them move further along. So that was where Community First uh, was, was originated. And we really had a, a, a very um, steep glide path. Um, I think in December, we came up with this. January 15th, we had already partnered with, with uh, Fountain House. So it was the four of us. And Fountain House has the expertise 
with mental health challenges. They have the community setting. They, they have a sense of community already in the neighborhood. Breaking ground was skilled with homeless outreach. The Midtown Community Court had a host of services that weren't being used and needed to be brought out to the street to those who needed them. And then the Alliance had resources. We had the, the commitment to the neighborhood and to the community. And we had the relationships in the city to try to move this forward. So the Alliance funded it in January. Um, it had some quick successes. And again, it was meeting people where they were. There's no, as I was telling Andy, when I reflect on it, we shouldn't have a system that, that the unhoused and people in need of assistance have to fit into. We should have a system that adapts to meet the needs of those in need of assistance. And that's what we tried to, to build with breaking ground, thanks to the strategic partnerships with Fountain House, breaking ground, and the community court. So within, um, within a couple of short months, we were able to reach out to the city and what the Alliance started um, with, with the help of the partners in January was adopted by the city as a pilot program. And the city is funding this program in Times Square for the next 12 months. So we've- Let's, um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Let, let, uh, we, let's, let's leave that there for now and we're gonna come sure. back to some of sorry. these issues. That's a nice Later. way of saying I talk too much, Andy. That's okay. But everyone has a lot to say. So um, let's let's turn to Bea now. So your organization is the the biggest, one of the biggest, the biggest private funder of projects that aim at ending what you call the cycle of mass homelessness. So can you just talk a little bit about some of the efforts that uh, Trinity is putting its support behind right now? Sure. Thank you, Andy. And it's not a competition. If anyone wants to fund more than we do, please go ahead. There are so many needs in the space and we need a lot of funding. Um, so as Andy said, um, I work for Trinity Church Wall Street. We are focused um, in the housing and homelessness side of ending what we call the cycle of mass homelessness. And we're very intentional about saying that because that is really what it is. It is it is a cycle. We're at a level, we've been at a level of mass homelessness for a long time in the city. And let's also call it for what it is. It's directly impacting communities of color. Over 94% of people in sh shelter um, are black or brown. So it really, really has just such a disparate impact in our city, in our country, and it's really um, one that we need to break. So within that, at Trinity, we focus on various strategies um, to address the needs of those that are unhoused or housing unstable. Um, so that includes everything from funding direct services. We also fund a lot of advocacy work, which we think is really key. Um, we fund a lot of work around what we call narrative change, ensuring that um, the voices of people like Shams are reflected in, in the news and that people hear the story straight from, from, from people like Shams and, and so many others. And then we also really focus on ensuring um, the long-term approach towards housing stability, which is that the reality is we need a lot more physical housing units to put people in. Um, so yes, people definitely need services, people need support. They also need a safe roof that's affordable, that's clean, that allows them to live with in dignity and respect. So with that, we found that many organizations um, that produce and create and manage supportive housing. Um, and I, I know that most of us here know what supportive housing is, but just to, just to name it in case supportive housing is permanent housing with services on site so that you have the people that are working with you right there in the building um, at, at your disposal so you can access them at any point. And it really came, um, came about in the 1970s, 1980s um, as, as a way to really address chronic homelessness and the needs of so many people that were living on the streets of New York. Um, and it really is the most humane way of really addressing the needs of these population. It's also really cost effective. There's been multiple studies that have shown the amount of money that is saved across various systems, including healthcare and many others, when you house somebody in supportive housing. And it, it, and it works. Um, I think in, in a study um, that, you, that looked at the New York, New York 
uh, two ag three agreement, which was a type of um, agreement to produce more supportive housing in New York State. Only 5% of people housed in supportive housing returned to shelter. So that's, that's really low, showing um, how successful that is. But Andy already said, there's only 35,000 units of supportive housing in New York, um, about 50,000 in New York State. Um, and the, there are many, many, many people that need it. So, you know, we, we always uh, name a, a statistic that's that for every five households that qualify, that have gone through the entire process to qualify for supportive housing, there's only one unit available to them. So think about that, five to one ratio. And we know that that's like, even the five is like too low of a number. When you really look at the numbers, it's probably something like 10 to one in terms of people that actually need this housing. So it's really important that we think about strategies um, and, and that we ensure that we um, get government to fund this type of housing and the creation for it. And one way in which um, Trinity is really excited um, in the opportunity of this moment is that we believe that the conversions of underutilized hotels to supportive housing is a great idea. So I cannot get into any specifics on any projects, but what I will tell you is that we have been funding a couple of feasibility studies for organizations that are looking at some of these hotels um, that potentially, hopefully, will create that opportunity. Of course, government is the one who's gonna like really, really fund it, right? Um, I always say philanthropy is the drop in the bucket, but it's that drop that can catalyze and start moving the waters, you know? Um, but we really get, need our government partners to come in and support these projects so that we can have a lot more units and meet the needs um, of housing unstable individuals in New York City and our neighbors. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, Bea. And just to kind of continue uh, in the vein of some of the stuff you were talking about, right now in New York, as everyone knows, we have this sudden glut of empty commercial real estate uh, and uh, hotels that have closed down and that people are talking now about how this has created an opportunity for uh, uh, the creation of a whole ton of affordable housing, in, including supportive housing. Um, the state has, uh, the legislature passed the Honda bill, which uh, the Housing Our Neighbors with Dignity Act, that is gonna provide some money for nonprofits to acquire and, and convert um, empty space into supportive housing and other kinds of affordable housing. But uh, does anyone, Bea or anyone else, want to jump in and talk a little bit about what really needs to happen to make this new housing a reality? Because we're sort of dealing with a paradox. We have supportive housing uh, as the, the most cost-effective way to, to house people, and yet there is uh, a, a complete shortage of it. There doesn't seem to be a huge shortage of jail cells. You know, the city provides uh, space in a congregate shelter for anyone who who is homeless. But these are not uh, great places to house people, especially people who are struggling with with mental illness. So, what what are the mechanisms or just some of the specifics that we need to have happen in order? for a bunch of new supportive housing to be created. I'm, I'm happy to kick, kick off. Um, Shams, did you wanna go first or you want me to? I'm gonna say something real quick and then I'll, I'll send it to you. One, I wanted to correct Tom um, real quickly. Um, in the congregate shelters, other than MICA shelters or residential treatment facilities, most of those congregate shelters, I've been to plenty of them. I lived in plenty of them. There are no services on site. Uh, even Project Renewal, they have shelters. And even though they provide the, the, the services in the building, the shelter component is separate from the service component. And one of the things, not understanding how these things work early on, was my desire to bring about a synergy between those things so that people that are in the shelters were able to get services. And without even realizing that Fountain House existed, I basically was replicating what I experienced at Project Renewal's Recovery Center in the Lucerne by bringing services on site. And instead of a person having to um, swipe Medicaid to access the services, 
it was made available to everyone there. And I point that out because that is one of the reasons why there are so many issues that are left unaddressed in the shelter system. And it's not just on the streets. A lot of us like myself have dual diagnoses, which is mental illness and substance use disorder. And the problem within the shelter system is that the shelter system doesn't recognize those as being disabilities. They uh, recognize a disability as having a physical disability. And so we don't have certain protections uh, that, are, that, that, that should be afforded to us in, in that respect. So I just wanted to um, kind of clarify that. There are some providers that do great jobs in terms of delivering services or getting people access to service, but there are others that are basically just warehousing people. And when you're in these environments, the streets become a safe haven for us. And that's sometimes why we, we're on the streets and on the trains and stuff like that. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to interject. Thank you, Chef. No, thank, thank you for clarifying that. That's actually really helpful. Um, so, Bea, you were going to say something about, about the funding aspect of it. I mean, listen, what does it take? It takes will. That's it. Like, somebody just has to say, we're going to get this done. Um, and what we're seeing right now, and, you know, I cannot go into a lot of details, is um, there, there's definitely some zoning challenges. Patricia Hernandez from CSH brought that up in the chat. There's definitely some zoning challenges um, that, frankly, yes, could be overcome, like they have in the past with other other things, right? But we need somebody at the top saying, this is really important, we need to get this done. Um, I am hopeful that, um, you know, we still don't officially know who the mayor is gonna be, but it's um, it, it sounds like one of the top leading candidate has already expressed, mm -hmm. um, Eric Adams, that um, he supports the conversion of these hotels. And, you know, I think like having somebody from the top saying, let's figure out how to do this, um, even though it's not easy, well, which is what's needed. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to mention is there are some current hotels that were formerly SRO, single room occupancies, and were illegally converted to hotels. So the conversion of those buildings back into SROs in a much better way, right? Like a, I'm never advocating for going back to the SROs of the battle times with like dark rooms, like, you know, terrible conditions. No, if you, if you rehab, rehabilitate those SROs in a way that is livable, meeting all sorts of um, codes, um, that could be a much easier path. So we think um, those don't have the zoning issues that were raised. I also wanted to really quickly pick up that Deborah on the chat said something about the scattered site model for supportive housing, which I agree is also a key one that we need to continue to replicate. Yeah. Can, I, can I say something real quick? Quickly. Um, Okay, so so yeah, um, the other thing in terms of like I like to use there was an example I saw of breaking ground had done to create a more dignified dwelling in a I believe a former hotel, and what I've kept trying to find was how cost effective it is with the conversion, and I believe if I'm correct that they did a successful conversion that was cheaper than it would be to put up a whole nother, like a shelter or something like that. So I think there are examples of how it could be done. And I think like you, like you said, uh, Bear, with the zoning and, and the will and, and, and actually advocating the funds the right way, we, sh we, we could be able to, to do more of that and we should. Thanks, thank you, Sham. And so, so Bear, you mentioned the magic word, um, Eric Adams. Um, as we all know, uh, the election is one week from today, and Mr. Adams is very, very, very likely to win. Um, he's he has talked a very good game when it comes to housing and homelessness. He talks about being a, as a kid being in a very unstable living situation where he was his family felt like they were in danger of being uh, evicted and thrown out onto the street. He's talked about his plan to, um, which is a plan other people have also spoken about to, to convert, and, and, and there's state legislation on this, to convert thousands of, um, of empty hotel rooms into shelter, uh, into, I'm sorry, into permanent supportive housing um, apartments. He likes to mention Fountain House and the importance of the clubhouse model. He's saying all these things. Um, he is also a little bit of a man of mystery. The Times did a story about him uh, yesterday that talked about how 
he's so many things to so many people that nobody really knows what he's actually going to do. So anyone jump in on this. What are you actually expecting uh, from Adams as a mayor? And do you think he can really deliver on some of the policy things that he's talked about? Anyone? Well, you know, I, I, I stood with him when he um, spoke on the conversion of the, the access to uh, converting the uh, distressed properties into supportive housing units. And just from the conversations we, we had, I think it's I think he he does understand the value of housing over, you know, sheltering people. And I think the big difference between him and the current administration is his, his desire to center housing first as a model. Um, and I think that's a huge step in the right direction. Um, so with that, it, it it's not just him, he's gonna face a lot going in, but at the same time, I think we also have um, a good uh, city council, uh, many that, that are coming into office in, in the next administration, I think collectively that they can work good, especially also with the change in uh, uh, in Albany. Uh, I think that we have a better chance of, of moving in a direction that is better for for all of us, for all stakeholders, including real estate. Okay, thank okay. you, James. Uh, Nancy, you uh, we're going to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have a lot of admiration for you know, Eric Adams' story that he repeated in many debates and on his campaign trail, just talking about his experience and being open about what it was like to be a kid who had to, you know, I remember him talking about bringing his garbage bag full of clothes to school so he wouldn't his have- Favorite it. story. Yes. Well, I mean, it. what it does to me is it, it underlines that, you know, he may have a receptivity to understanding that people may refuse services and going into shelters because they're not safe. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to be working on as, as a really serious project, you know, making shelters feel safe, increasing the number of stabilization beds, um, creating single rooms for women, right? Currently there are no single rooms for women who often have, you know, a history of trauma. There are no wheelchair accessible stabilization beds at all. There are many things that he could work on in the transition phase that would, you know, help people in that place where they're just trying to get stable before they get into the permanent level of housing. So what, you know, what I think I, I do have hope that he will hear that and because he can relate to it. And I, I think that that's the part that we really need to emphasize is that while people are in that stage and they can be in that stage for quite some time as they're trying to get their lives together, they need the serve the community outreach that builds the trusting relationships, you know, more funding for programs that do that, like on ramps, um, more programs like, you know, clubhouses that will help them get stable while they get their lives together is something, you know, he's clearly said that he's, he's behind with his support of Fountain House. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. Thank you. Anyone else? Tom? Oh, I'm, I'm optimistic. sorry, you were unmuted. So. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I am optimistic. Uh, he has, he's saying all the right things. And I think that, that as, as, his constituents, we need to just follow through and make sure that he does the right things. And I think that that's gonna happen. I, um, I am also hopeful and optimistic. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I wanna turn now there. He, this is a question that um, the so audience members were uh, solicited to send in some questions during this week, even before uh, this panel began. Someone sent in this question which I think is a very good one. Do the current supportive housing options that exist actually match, actually match the needs of people experiencing homelessness? Um, and I think, Bea, this is something that you and I were speaking about a little bit, and, and you, you had been talking about how there's a, a need for something that's in between completely supportive housing and, uh, and fully independent housing that provides some level of support um is that you want to talk a little bit about that 
Yeah, um, basically my point, um, and you know, I, I've learned this from all of you and all of those that work in the field, many um, who are listening today, is that right when you think about the housing needs, there's a it's a spectrum, right? Like some people really just need a key, here's a key to your place, and you're good. Some other people need something in the supportive housing model, which is again um, the services in the building. There's so many people that fall in between, you know, that definitely need a, a level of services, um, but that do not necessarily need supportive services. And it's important to to know that because as we started this conversation, there is, you know, the mismatch between the demand and the supply for supportive housing is so great. At a minimum, it's a five to one, right? Probably higher, that you want to make sure that those units are truly going to the people that truly need supportive housing. So sort of like what is that in between? Um, and you know, there are some models that are basically um, a permanent housing and having the services suite provided in the community that I think are working really well. Um, I know there's some in New York City um, that that have been um, elaborate, like that have been like trying to be replicated across. Um, but the, the the reality is we need to start thinking about like, is that I don't know, is there like two other like term sheets that HPD puts out of these other two types of housing, you know, so that you have like four buckets as opposed to more like two that you have right now. So that was more my point. Um, and I welcome others' comments that are experts in this field. I, I, yes, Shams, I was going to ask you about this because you had mentioned when we spoke uh, the other day that even people who who seem who, who the system thinks are ready for independent housing still often need a lot of help. And there are a lot of people who kind of get moved to a permanent apartment and because they don't really have the tools to kind of live day to day, they end up back on the street. So if you want to talk about that or whatever else you were going to talk about when you raised your hand. Yeah, basically that, that that's where I was going to go. I mean, this is one of the other things about the next administration. We really have to revamp, change DHS from the top down um, and how it operates because a lot of those things creates barriers for, for, for many people on, on every level dealing with homelessness and housing insecurity. So in my particular situation, I'm kind of, people say you're happily housed. And I'm like, no, not really. <laughs> like, I'm glad to have a home. But one of the things about me taking the city FEPS voucher was that it doesn't come with supportive services or any type of aftercare services. So I'm, you know, it's almost emotional when I think about it, you know, and, and because at the end of the day, uh, I still, first of all, I still deal with mental illness and I struggle um, in my own dwelling. Uh, I, I think I was telling you that every day I go and I go to the same park bench I used to sleep on in Harlem every single night. I go and I sit there for a few minutes and sometimes I just, especially when the weather's warm, I say to myself like, wow, I'm really more comfortable here than I am in my own apartment. And, 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 you know, this is just a sign that, you know, perhaps getting a call once a month just to check on me and see if I'm okay could be beneficial to me. I went into a situation where I had, the city wasn't paying the uh, rent. Uh, they had a mistake uh, for five months. And had I not had the ability to summons the press and call a few friends in high places, I very well much would be back in the streets, um, less than a year of being in my own place. And so with supportive housing, a person that may have a case manager that checks in could actually go and say, hey, look, um, I, there's a problem with your rent. Let me take care of it. You know, just, you had a problem paying your electricity. With me, it was simple things like, wait a minute, I've been homeless for so many years. I don't even know how to shop for food. I don't know how to do a food budget. So these are just things that what I'm pushing for is, because uh, there are stigmas with the idea of supportive housing. What I'm trying to push for is something that we're calling aftercare services that will be tied to a person exiting the shelter system. And it's not for everybody. There's some people that are great on their own, but you know, without proper uh, assessment, you can just be thrown in your own place like myself and 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 be one step 
from back in in the in the in the, in the experience of homelessness. Uh, so I'm I'm glad that I connected with Fountain House and I have a great relationship with uh, uh, Project Renewal because I'm able to 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 reach out and 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 sometimes that's difficult because you got to make sure that um, that you're connected so that the services that you're you're able to get and with the way H, uh, DHS and HRA operates they're more trying to steer you away from that now that you're on your own and say, well, you know, you got the apartment, go get a job or whatever, you know. Thank you very much, Dan. Nancy. I just wanted to just, I'm, I'm so grateful that you've connected with Fountain House Shams because I, I really do think that you're speaking to the power of community and outreach, regular contact that people can make with those who might feel isolated and might feel like they don't want to spend time in their homes. We saw that very clearly during the pandemic, the amount of isolation that was you know, so harmful to people's mental health. And just to kind of reiterate that there are, you know, 14 other clubhouses around New York City and 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 they are also national and international. And what they do is 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 reach out to people and, and they also invite people to come in and be around as often as they want to be and spend their entire days with us and and do meaningful work together and also the member support um, member to member support is is key to our success, which is you know to somebody's point in the in the chat, you know the peer movement is also you know what we need to keep building up and need to keep funding and um, respite centers are a perfect example of that. Respite centers being a place that people can go as an alternative to going to the hospital when they're not feeling well. They can get a full range of social service supports, case management, but also peer support. Most importantly, they they can have groups. They can come and go when they choose, have their own key. It's sort of like a little bed and breakfast and they they get everything they need there and, and can stay for up to a month. So it's, it's one of those really kind of well-kept secrets in New York City for people with mental health issues. And we want to help, you know, we hope that that gets increased funding as well and is run by some amazing people. So, so clubhouses and respite centers, I think that's what needs the support of the city right now too. Thank you. We, we need one in Harlem. <laughs> we need a fountain house in Harlem. I got to say it. <laughs> I got some people from Harlem there. They would, they would be mad at me if I didn't say it. Nancy, uh, thank you for mentioning respite houses, uh, respite, what are they called? Respite centers. They're respite centers, yep. Uh, which I was, I was hoping you would talk about a little bit. How many, uh, how many beds in, I mean, is that a t teeny tiny thing? How many beds in respite centers are there throughout the city? They're small. They, they vary from, I believe they're between eight and 12 Beds. I mean, somebody correct me if I'm wrong about that. I'm not an expert, but I've visited um, the one run by Community Access um, in the East Village, and that and remembering that that's about how many people can stay there at a time, and and that's why we need increased funding because to get into them, you know, it's it's there's not always an available bed, but it's worth trying, um, and you know, sometimes it can happen overnight. We have there's Riverdale Mental Health that runs one. There's uh, the community access one, um, services for the underserved has one in Brooklyn, um, Goddard Riverside, I believe. So they're they're amazing places, and and you know we we need more of them throughout the city. If yeah, Harlem would be a great location, but I think you were saying for a clubhouse chance, <laughs> we can work on that. Um, th thank you. Th a, a question that or, uh, something I realized that I don't really have a clear understanding of, and maybe a lot of other people out there don't either, is sort of what is day-to-day -day life actually like in a supportive housing building? Let's let's set aside the scatter site housing where you know it's just an apartment or two in a building, but in a, in a dedicated supportive housing building. Um, what do people, you know, how do people engage with services? What are the ways that the supports work? Shams, I know you have a lot of friends. Uh, you, you've never lived in supportive housing, but you have a number of friends who do, who you talk to about this stuff. Uh, you, can you talk a little bit about sort of what, what the day-to-day -day existence is? Well, real quickly, let me just let you know, um, 
at the shelter I, I came from, Kenton Hall, it, the day-to-day -day existence was, you know, a lot of people dealing with substance uh, use issues, a lot of people uh, dealing with mental health issues with, with very little treatment. Uh, the Lucerne Hotel, as you all know, there were, there were problems there until we brought those services on site and made it available to every, everybody. So there were supportive services in the building. So now many of the Lucerne uh, residents had moved into a supportive housing building in, in, uh, in Harlem. And I encountered them many times and, and I'm, I'm actually kind of upset that I didn't get into that building. They have a garden and all this other beautiful stuff. But when I walked past that building, the same thing that, the things that I saw in on Bowery, the things that I saw in Bowery, the things that we, we dealt with on, on the Upper West Side does not exist. The building is across the street from a luxury building and you won't know the difference. So when I talk to the residents that are in the, in the supportive housing building, it's a whole difference. I know these guys, I spent a lot of time with them and it's like they're different people now. They, they look so good. They're always talking high. And sometimes, they, they, you know, I walk away kind of like, you know, emotional because they talk about what it felt like to actually, or what it feels like to actually be in their own apartment, their own space. And you could just see how dignified they now feel as, com com you know, when I compare it to the, to the, how they were in the, uh, in the uh, not in the Lucerne, in, 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 in the shelters that we came from. And so from that perspective, I can see the value. And, and I also deal with Project Renewal who actually visits the building. And so that connection, that continued connection benefits those residents in so many different ways. Thank you. Thank you, Shams. Anybody else want to jump in on, on that one? I, I just wanted to jump in. Um, so Shams noted um, how beautiful the supportive housing building in Harlem was. And supportive housing buildings are wonderful, um, both on the inside and the outside, right? And I, the reason I want to bring this up is that unfortunately we have seen a lot of NIMBYism um, for any type of affordable housing, including supportive housing, not in my backyard, NIMBYism in New York City. And um, it is so unfortunate to see that. And it is really important that we all are very active and Shams has done an amazing job at really representing the voices and, and humanizing the people that ultimately will leave in these buildings. Um, because it is so important that we all open our arms as widely as we can and we welcome them into our neighborhoods in these beautiful buildings that are located across our city. Thanks, thank you very much, Bea. Um, jumping, jumping around a little bit, I wanted to <clears throat> go back to something that uh, Tom and Shams uh, and I guess Nancy too were, were talking about earlier about outreach and sort of about the importance of building trust because there are on the street um, a lot of people who often will who, who become suspicious of the authorities for all kinds of reasons uh, this the city you know in the past year or so has gotten very, very aggressive about simply tearing people's encampments down if they're living on the street. Uh, this makes the, the work of the outreach people who, who work with the city a lot harder because, you know, somebody sees somebody in an orange uh, vest uh, coming and they just kind of like turn their head or, 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 or go the other way. So, Tom, you, you, you the, the Alliance has talked a lot about the, like moving at the speed of trust, I think is how someone, someone put it. How, what kinds of um, techniques have you used that get people to, 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 to trust the person who's offering services and to kind of make that very, because uh, it's a long kind of uh, path with many steps get to the place where they're actually able to to accept and move into housing if it happens to be available, which of course we know there is a shortage of it. But why you want to talk about that a little bit? I think it comes down to 
three things, show that you care, do what you say you're going to do and keep coming back. Nancy, you have something to I mean, yes, this is, I mean, this is the heart of our person centered approach that we are advocating for in Fort Greene Park and, and also what the community navigators in our community first program have been doing both in Times Square and at our recharge station, which all of you should visit. It's at 45th and Broadway. Um, you can see it in action, you know, when just like in Fountain House, when you, you know, sort of stay in one place and let people come to you at their own pace and have you know, a, you know, increasing kind of connection with people at the pace that they want to go at where they start to see you as a consistent person. They start to see you as someone that they, you know, isn't threatening, is, is going to just just be there and, and maybe be offering things that they need, whether it's, you know, just a pair of gloves in the winter or whether it's, you know, a shelter or whether it's just, you know, someone to talk to. It's, it's really about people starting to feel like these are these are people that I can rely on. I can sense that I can trust them. I mean, I, th I think that the clubhouse people, the peers, the members, and the staff are, are kind of well-versed in just kind of using their authentic selves to connect with people and not trying to be, you know, caseworkers, not trying to be people who force a solution when, when people aren't ready for it. And really have a, instead, you know, a real patience for, you know, you come to me when you're ready, you know, you right. have a story that brought you here that I, I want to understand, I want to hear. And I, and when you're ready, you know, you can share it with me when you're ready, you can tell me what you need and, and, and I'll help you with what you need when you're there. But it, if, if all you need is just a friend and someone to listen to, that's, that's cool too. I, I don't, I don't, you know, sometimes it can, we have to take things slowly. We have to, just slow down and be present with people. And that's the key because change can be incredibly slow. And we may think we know the solution for people, but you know, when they're, when they're at a place in their lives where they can feel trust that can, it could take a whole life, you know, a whole lifetime to erase what, what has been done because most of the people that are on the street have a huge history of trauma and, you know, to erase that and to, to build trust is, you know, it's, it's an art. So, you know, we just have to keep plugging along and working at it. Thank you. And, and Tom, were you going to add something no. on top of that or, okay. Um, so now I see we're starting to run a little low on time. There was one other thing I wanted to uh, get to. Um, Bea, when we had spoken, you mentioned that um, there was actually more of a need for supportive housing for families than there is for single adults. And you rarely really hear much about supportive housing for families. It's a, it's a very, you know, if, if, if supportive housing for single adults is complicated, supportive housing for families is, is much, much more complicated. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of what those challenges are? And maybe if you know of any, what some of the solutions are that are out there? Sure, sure. I do want to clarify that I, I it's not that it's a, they both, it's a need for both populations. I don't, I, you know, it's not more one or the other, but traditionally um, supportive housing has been more for the singles population. And um, yes, there is a need for more supportive housing for families. Um, there are some models, but it is, it's become, it's for some reason it's just harder to implement. But um, the reason I wanted to bring it up is that I know that today we're talking about mental health needs and um, predominantly probably we're thinking more of the adults. Um, but let's remember 15,000 kids left in a homeless shelter last night in New York City. Um, and that is really important for us to, to think about and address because those kids have mental health needs too. And, you know, Shams, as, as he was sharing his story, he, he, he alluded to it, right? The toxic stress that being in a shelter creates for these children many times triggers what's called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs is the clinical name. And that can have a long lasting impact on somebody's trajectory. Um, so it's really important that we think about that. And yes, so supportive housing um, for families that are currently in shelter take also the service needs of the children. Um, it's not just of the heads of household, but also of the children. And somebody in the chat asked what kind of services are provided. So that's, you know, everything from mental health services, 
uh, substance abuse services for, for those that need them, counseling, financial counseling, mental health counseling, et cetera, tutoring for the kids. Um, so yes, there is a need to do a lot more, but um, I just wanna be clear, there's a need to do a lot more supportive housing across the board, board for both singles and families. James, you, you had mentioned that uh, the, 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 the most difficult and most stressful phase of your, uh, of your homelessness career was when you were raising your son in uh, a shelter uh, because you, as a dad, were trying to n not just look out for yourself, which is what a single adult does, but protect him from you know all kinds of dangerous and unsavory things is that is that's a problem right you're muted it's a it's a huge problem and and I, I as much as i've been speaking and stuff like that one of the 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 things about my experience that i'm i haven't really discussed as much is my experience in the family shelters um, being a single uh, uh, parent in the family shelters, um, because that experience of raising my son un under those conditions um, is the most traumatic of my entire homeless experience from 10 years old to now. And sometimes I'm reminded of it and I'm I'm almost in tears when you mention, uh, Bea, the adverse childhood experience, because every, every so often, my son will send me a message and he's indicating a lot of the things that he's been through and a lot of the stuff that we've survived. And it brings me back to, you know, first of all, it makes me realize that those things still affect him in some way. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm thinking my son is doing great, but obviously there are things about that experience that has never escaped him. And 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 it, it just reminds me of, just being a, a parent and and having to experience, you know, being turned away for services, being shuffled along from shelter to shelter every 10 days, ineligible, new shelter somewhere else, having to make decisions while he's school, he I have to return bring him to school. There were times when the moving around would interrupt his school. So I would end up saying, let me leave the shelter and I'd stay in places that were just totally unsafe. Um, and, and these are the things that uh, without, of, of, with, without the proper support in the shelter, outside of the shelter, you know, we returned back to the shelter. We got two vouchers and one year we were back in the shelter. And the only reason why we, we didn't stay in that experience because when he aged out, they wouldn't allow us to go back in as a family and instructed myself and my son to go to Bellevue. I think things have changed now, but it's, it was a difficult road. Um, that, that's horrible. <laughs> um, uh, I believe we're, we have a, a few more minutes. Um, here's another question that was submitted by um, so the, in the audience, how can people who are caring for their mentally ill loved ones help find them supportive housing? Is the only pathway to supportive housing that you must have experienced homelessness or is there supportive housing that's available for people to move into somewhere other than from the street or the shelter? Can someone speak about that? No one should know. It's a good I mean, question. Yeah, I mean, it is. It is honestly one of the biggest difficulties for us in in helping people get supportive housing is that the the quickest route to it is through through spending time in the shelter and 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 even then you you know really have to be connected with one of the outreach consortiums that can provide you with you know an outreach worker, case management, and and help you with the 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 whole application process, which is super cumbersome. And I think we've talked about Andy, like you have, you have to be able to document um, that you've been homeless for the past nine out of 12 months and, you know, document every month for the last four years in the housing application that, you know, can be very prohibitive for people who maybe have not 
kept track of every place they've lived for the last four years. So those kinds of things are things that need to be addressed for, you know, helping people get the supportive housing. Yeah, we, we also have to um, be more educational to the general public. I think we would talk about nimbyism at one point. And um, I think that uh, one of the main reasons why I'm so, uh, I guess you could say transparent is because I try to set myself as, uh, up as an example of someone who's been through all of that, but can still live amongst communities, still be productive, a productive member of the, of the society and, and, and try to remove those stigmas. So I actually speak out, I speak to um, some of the people who opposed us at the Lucerne, we, we go out, we eat, and we discuss ways to make the city better. And, and part of that type of outreach to them is to try and show them that maybe they're getting this wrong. And I think instead of a, a adversarial uh, position, my position is more like, let's educate them, let's enlighten them and let them know that, you know, I may deal with mental illness or substance use disorder or been chronically homeless, but with the right support, I could actually become a good person. Let me just say this. Keep in mind what I said about when I was ready to hang it up, commit suicide. Less than six months later during the pandemic, I almost died from COVID. And I, I begged every God that you can mention <laughs> to give me another shot at life. But that is the difference between me being on the streets with no services to me actually getting services and getting the help that I, I so needed and, and, and feeling like, you know what? I wanna live. And from that experience, that's why I'm full steam ahead <laughs> as the homeless hero, because I, I now found a sense of purpose. And everybody that we see in the streets is an, I'm just an example of that. They all can uh, to, could, could have that same trajectory if they were given the right services. And can I, can I just say an amen to that? Thank yeah. you, Shams, really, truly. Um, I, I just wanted to say, you know, let's look at how broken or system is that you have to, you, you basically almost like have to be homeless in a DHS shelter in order to access supportive housing. Like, what does that say about our values, uh, you know, from a systems perspective and a society that we like almost like force you into that? Like if you're couch surfing, for years, you're you're still homeless, but you still don't qualify for supportive housing because you have not been in a DHS shelter, um, and that is just absolutely ridiculous. And um, we should um, ensure that that changes. And once you go into the DHS shelters and there's no services on site, you like my like in my case, you get broken down, you get dehumanized, and it exacerbates the mental illness and whatever other issues that you may have. There were so many people I met. Who, did, who walked in with no problems and within months ended up developing issues and stuff like that. So a lot of that has to be changed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, all of you for that. Um, the people who are running this uh, webinar, is there, um, are there questions uh, that the audience has sent in that, should I just read one from here, or is there something? Is someone going to uh, ask one or two of those before we before we uh, say goodbye? Yep. Uh, so we do have one question that we'd like to ask. Um, oh, let me get to that screen. Um, everyone except for DHS seems to realize that the concrete shelter model is traumatic and counterproductive to connecting people to housing and that people are choosing to be on the street rather than enter shelters. What can we do to push DHS to take a critical look at the model and make adjustments? Great question. Jams? Oh, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I think we have to turn, first of all, one of the things that I'm pushing for is for the next administration to appoint someone as being, I guess, the deputy mayor or commissioner of, of, of um, housing and homelessness and see the interlink between both of those things. Also to appoint a commission to address housing and homelessness that will be comprised of all stakeholders. I think all stakeholders need, including and especially 
directly impacted people like myself should be in the room. We should have a, a, a voice in the discussion, a seat at the table and a hand in the decision making. But with all of us in the same space, we'll be able to come up with human uh, uh, holistic solutions to help address the problem. And I think, um, that, you know, in the, in the quick nutshell, DHS is a failed is a failed entity. It is not working, and we need to change it from the top down. I'm not just talking personnel. I'm talking operations. It it has to right. it has to be changed because it's not working. Th thank you, Shams. Uh, are, are are we totally out of time? Does anybody else want to jump in real quick? We only have apparently seconds left. I fully fully agree with Shams on everything he just said. Okay. So it's uh, it's 1025. Um, why don't we leave it there? I thank all of you so much, Shams, Tom, Bea, Nancy, you've really kind of given us a lot to think about and even a little bit of hope, which is nice these days. Um, so thank you all and uh, farewell. And um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm, I wish I could put in a plug for the next panel, but I do not immediately remember what it's about. So maybe, uh, Mr. Ms. MC, you can tell us uh, what the next Fountain House panel in this series is going to be. Sure. Thank you so much, Andy. This concludes today's panel. Please be sure to register for our third and final panel, Mental Health as Public Health, taking place on November 8th. You can RSVP by visiting fountainhouse.org slash MHIT. Thank you all and have a good day.